My name is Marco Hansen. I'm a uh, Spanish court interpreter and legal translator in Austin and Houston, Texas. And I like to do a webinar on Saturday afternoons because this is when most people are available and uh, able to join in. And we do all different topics. Today is on death certificate translation. And afterwards, um, if you want a copy of the document that we used, that I translated for your own reference, that'll be available on my blog. I'm going to put some links here in the chat. Uh, to this this uh, series is a fundraiser for our Asian Family Support Services of Austin, which provides uh, counseling and support and legal help for uh, people from all over Asia who are um, caught in situations of domestic violence and trafficking here in the U.S very worthy of your donations and support. Um, there's also a link to our YouTube channel where this will be posted next week and to my blog where the document will be uploaded. And then if you'd like to leave me a review, um, my company Texan Translation is a small family business. Almost everyone who works here is related. Uh, and then we have a couple employees. And so it really helps to have um, positive reviews on Google Maps. That's where everybody goes these days. You don't have to set up an account. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and share it and go over the results. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can see the poll on your screen now. I want to make sure I'm doing this right. Okay. Uh, do you need to be a certified translator in the U.S. to prepare certified translations? The answer is no. Um, there is no government certification for translators in the U.S. There is one through the American Translators Association, but almost no one requires it. And in the case of a death certificate, no one's ever asked me for that. Uh, number two, what is the minimum education required? None. There is no education requirement. Almost all translators in the U.S. have a bachelor's degree. That's sort of the norm, but it's not a legal requirement. And a lot of, a lot of us have graduate degrees. Number three, can you prepare a certified translation for a document about yourself? No. Um, I, most uh, end users will reject that if they see your name somewhere on the certificate and also your name signing as a translator. That's, that's not a law, but that's a standard practice. It has to be unbiased and neutral because somebody else uh, prepared it. Number four, do certified translation in the U.S. need to be notarized? Rarely is the correct choice. Um, most uh, end users don't care if it's notarized. Some translators like to get it notarized because it just looks more official, especially for people from other countries where everything has lots of stamps and seals on it. They like to add a notarization, but the notarization really just confirms the identity of the translator who signed the certification. It doesn't add much legal um, value to it. Number five, do certified translations in the U.S. need to be apostilled? Again, rarely. Um, an apostille is sort of like an international notarization. It's when a document is created by one government and it's going to be used by a foreign government. And it says this is a legitimate document and we've verified the identity of the person who created it. Um, so if a death certificate, say, is generated in Mexico and is to be used by a U.S. government entity, that entity could request uh, an apostille, in which case the Secretary of State in Mexico would have to review it and put an additional page on it. Um, and then when it came to the U.S., that notar that apostille may or may not need to be translated, but it's all the decision of number six, the end user, the recipient of the translation. That's who decides what steps need to be taken. So if somebody approaches you as a translator and says, can you translate this death certificate? You have to find out what's the source language, what's the target language, what country it's going to, and what the requirements are of whoever in that um recipient country are, what, what steps they want to see to make sure that it's legal and official. So any questions about this um, poll before I jump into uh, today's topic, to today's demonstration? You can put those in the chat and I'll glance over there and answer them as, as they come up. But for now, I'm going to share screen and show you the Word file Again, if I could uh, get a thumbs up that you're looking at my Word file now and not just me, that'd be nice. Um, there, I see Tracy's giving me a, an emoji thumbs up. So this is uh, the blank cover sheet that I put on all my certified translations when I'm starting out when they're in Spanish and English. You don't have to do both languages. It does have to be in the language of whoever's receiving it, so English in this case. And where you see a yellow highlighting, I would go back in and uh, fill in the title or description of the document, my own name, my contact information, 
And then if it needed to be notarized, I would um, use this notary section here. In this case, it doesn't, so I'll delete that. And we'll go on to page two, which shows a placed image, a JPEG captured from the PDF and pasted into the Word file of the original. I like to put that all in one document so they all have the same header and footer and pagination, and it's all um, sort of locks it together um, for security purposes. And that reduces the chance that somebody could take my translation and staple it onto another source document that doesn't correspond. Um, again, that's that's just a, a practice here at Texan Translation and not necessarily a requirement. You can just give your client to the translation and then he or she can um, submit it together with a copy of the original. So here we have a death certificate where I've blurred out all the codes and in Photoshop and I've changed the names and the numbers to protect the confidentiality of the actual person. <laughs> that this pertains to. Um, some of you noticed the Facebook comments about Dulcinea Toboso de la Mancha and Salma Hayek being the people named. I wanted to make it obvious that it wasn't real people here involved because some, some people get scared that I'm posting confidential information online. And I don't do that. That's, of course, unprofessional. So I've split the screen. And if you have a wide enough monitor, I recommend putting the source on one side and the target on the other side so you can keep it open while you're translating. But if you have a smaller laptop, then top and bottom makes sense. And because of the way Zoom shares screen, I feel it's more helpful to do it this way. I've already translated the entire thing and printed it up, and I have it sitting here on my desk. So we're going to sort of skip over the step where I research the meaning of acronyms and medical terminology that's new to me and just show you how we set up the actual document, assuming you already are familiar with the terminology. So the first thing I would do is look at the page as a whole. And notice that it's printed on a decorative border and it has some security marks in the background. And so I would want to mention that because you want to acknowledge everything in the source when you're translating into the target language. So I would say decorative, decorative border sur surrounds page. And I put this in square brackets to indicate that it's a translator's note and that it's not found in the original. And then I would say watermark in center of page with circular seal of Mexico, close bracket, and then type the text that's actually found in that seal. Let me scroll down so you can see there in the background real faint, there's the big um, serpent and eagle on the cactus, and then it says Estados Unidos Mexicanos around there, and I use United Mexican States. Some people will say United States of Mexico. That's fine. Okay, United Mexican States. And then I'll go back and start um, actually translating the text. And I like to insert a table because there's um, sort of three sections going across and I want to keep them straight. For me, it's easiest to use a table like this. And then I can center for page, for folio, I'll use page. And then I'll put B84 space 56138840. And if you see me make a mistake as we go, feel free to point it out in the chat. I do make mistakes on these because I'm nervous typing in front of an audience um, and then i'll put barcode under that uh, here in the middle um, i would describe that again as a round circular seal uh, in square brackets round circular seal of mexico and then i'll type the text that i see inside that seal a lot of translators will just ignore the text inside of a rubber stamp or a seal, but then the recipient wonders, what does this say? Is this important to my decision on whether to accept this document? So I say, United Mexican States, you should transcribe every single word you see on the page that's legible, even if it's tiny. And then here we have centered control E, it's the shortcut for centering in Word, on a PC at least, electronic identifier. Electronic identifier, I think that's how you spell identifier. If you have a full-size keyboard and you know how to do the 10 key, it's faster for typing long strings of words or code. Laptops usually don't have that. La clave única de registro de población, which is called the CURP. Um, I, would, I like to say unique population registry code. Whatever translation you come up with, just make it consistent throughout the document. And then here we have UKSG5014862 
PGHSD. And again, this is not anyone's really real CURP. It's changed in Photoshop. Barcode again. Número de certificado de defunción de la SSA. Um, CURP stands for Clave Única de Registro de Población, Andrew. And that's just something found on a lot of Mexican documents. There's a CURP and there's a CRIP, which I think was the predecessor to the CURP. And so depending on how old the document is, it may have one or more of these different codes on it. Número de certificado, I'll put um, death certificate number from the health department. In Spanish, in case it's too small for you to read, it says Número de Certificado de Función de la SSA. Uh, English-speaking recipient probably wouldn't know what the SSA stands for, and I had to look it up, and it's like the uh, Secretaría de uh, Secretaría de something Sanitación. Sani, uh, I don't remember. It's a it's an old organization which has since changed name, and the closest equivalent in the U.S. would be the Health Department. Or the Department of Health. You can you can put these uh, in different orders. You could say the number of the certificate of death from the Department of Health, or to be more concise in English, you can put the adjectives in front and make it look like this. There's really more than one correct solution to most translation challenges. Entidad de registro, I will put a registration entity, registering entity, registry entity would be fine. Um, Morelos is the state. Municipio de Registro, Registration Municipality is pretty close to a municipio. Hochitepec, that's fun to say. And then I see a little table underneath here. You don't have to recreate this whole table, but if you're going to get more than one of these, it might be to your advantage to create it so that the next one you do will be easier to insert there. So I'm going to insert one that's four columns by two rows using this little shortcut here in the Word settings bar. And then I'm going to make all of this text a little smaller. So I'll select the whole table with a shift and my arrows and then use the control and the left bracket key to go down to eight points. That looks like about eight point type to me for oficialia. That is a kind of office, it's a specific kind, but office is as close as um, we have in English, as far as I'm concerned, book, um, for libro, uh, certificate, for acta, uh, fecha de registro, date of registration or registry, and then I'll transcribe those numbers, 8658. Eight. Um, here we have the day, month, year format with the zero in front of the month. I feel like it's much more common in the US to put month, day, year without a zero in front of the month. And so that's the way I'm going to transcribe it. And because there's no day, there's no month 20, it'll be obvious to the recipient that this is using the um, month, day, year format. If you're worried that there's going to be misunderstanding, like if it's 9, 8, 2021, 20, it could be either month or, or day, then it's fine to spell out the month. You could say September 20th, 2021. That would be clearer. Um, Luis says, is that word? Yes, I'm using a PC and Microsoft Word here. So now I'm going to go back up and turn off the borders, um, all borders in this table, just so it looks more like the original, but I'll leave the borders on that little table down there. And then I'm not going to mess with all these lines here. Oh, yeah. It's easy enough to do. I'm going to put in some hyphens and hit enter, and I'll create this horizontal line, and then control E to center, and I'll put um, decedents information for datos de la persona fallecida. You could put data about the deceased person. That's fine, too, but it's um, not as concise as I would expect to see in the U.S. version. Um, so now we have, uh, I'm going to hit control L to left justify again tab over, caps lock, and type in Dulcinea, tap, tap, tab, Doboso, tab, tap, tab, de la mancha, and then put in some hyphens and hit enter again, and Word changes that automatically into this horizontal line. Tab, tab, caps lock off. For nombres, um, primer apellido and segundo apellido, the closest equivalent in the U.S. document would be del Toboso, yes. 
<laughs> Thank you, Josefa, our, um, our classical Spanish literature expert on today's call. Uh, Luis says, I thought translators use different software. Uh, it depends on whether you're translating a, a text file to another text file or a PDF to a text file. Since the original is a PDF that can't be converted into um, text by any clean and simple means. I'm translating visually from the PDF and typing it in Word. And so some translators do use other software like uh, Trados or Deja Vu for other kinds of jobs. Um, but this seems to work best for this type of order. So for nombres, I put first and middle names. If you could put names, that's not wrong. Oh, and there's a colon after that. And then tab. A uh, first surname is probably the most concise way to say primer apellido. You could say first last name, but that sounds odd to say first and last right in a row. And then second surname. Um, sometimes I use uh, father surname, mother surname, but since it used primer and segundo in the Spanish, it didn't seem as accurate. If you want to make the formatting match a little better, you can select this whole row and hit control left bracket a couple times to make that font smaller like it looks in the original, not a big deal. Then I'll go down to here, put in some hyphens and hit enter and Word generates that um, solid line again, tab, tab. Uh, for sex, mujer, we would never say sex woman in the US equivalent, we would put a uh, female. And so I'm going to translate mujer that way. Single, in the Spanish, soltero, soltera covers both genders, but in the English, single is gender neutral, so we don't have to indicate that. Um, for date of birth, I know that in this document, we're going um, day, month, year, and so I'm going to switch it around and put 5-3-1938, but now I'm kind of worried. I'm like, will the recipient understand? And I look up and I see, well, yes, earlier in the document, we already had a uh, month, day, year order, so that should be clear. And again, if you want to put in May 3rd, 1938, that's perfectly fine. I'm going to tab over and put sex following the capitalization of the original. Estado civil, a civil status doesn't really make sense in US English. I'm going to use marital status, which is the same thing. Um, and date of birth and go down to the next line, and then I'll go back up, highlight those, uh, control, left bracket, left bracket, to get down to that 10-point font again. I just like it to look enough like the original that it's easy to go back and forth between the two and find the corresponding information. Some people will, will make it very pretty and match fonts and everything, but I feel that's overkill. So here, um, for place of birth, we have Se Desconoce, Se Desconoce Tamaulipas. I'm going to put, also in all caps, unknown Tamaulipas um, for the entidad Tamaulipas, a state in Mexico, right across the border from where I grew up, and Mexican for nationality, hyphens, enter, turns into horizontal line, and then we have, take the caps lock off, place of birth, colon, tab, tab, entidad de registro de nacimiento, you could put, um, Entity of birth registration, but entidad, in Mexico they use the entidad federativa, I think, to refer to any of the states plus um, the Distrito Federal, at least back when, that, when this um, was created, but for the English-speaking recipient, I think state of birth registry or registration would be clear because almost all but one of the entidades in Mexico is a state, and in this case it's uh, the state of Tamaulipas. Nationality. Okay, and I'll go back and make that a little bit smaller. And then we have datos de la defunción with horizontal line on both sides. Control E to center that. Um, information regarding the death. And there are different ways to say, you know, defunción in some countries they'll use a fallecimiento or there's another noun. Um, but uh, death or decease are both understood on U.S. documents. I've got another question in the chat. So entidad means state. In Mexico, um, when it talks about an entidad and then it gives an example like Tamaulipas, it means state. In a lot of contexts, entidad would be entity. 
in the US, like if you're talking about the entity that's requesting the translation. You have to think about the context to choose there. Uh, the date was um, left justified tab 9-18-2021. The time was 12-52-00. The place was caps lock Ho Chi Tepec, Morelos, Mexico. They didn't have commas in the original, but I think um, it's assumed that people reading this will understand Morelos is a state and Hochitepec is a municipality, and that's not clear in the English where most people have never heard of Hochitepec, much less, or Morelos, much less Hochitepec. Um, Dalia Ramos, yes, you will be getting the recording. I will send it out in an email, and you can subscribe to the YouTube channel and get a notice when it's updated. Um, Cremation was the final destination of the cadaver. So down here we have date, time, place, and destino del cadáver. Um, I'm going to put a method of disposition just because I've seen that on U.S. death certificates. You could say the mm, destination of the cadaver, the destination of the body, um, the uh, final disposition. Um, there's Destination of the cadaver just sounds odd in English. We don't talk about it as a cadaver in this context. And so um, I feel like method of disposition, while not an exact translation, is a culturally appropriate translation, given the our knowledge of who's receiving this. Then we have some really fine print, and I'm going to zoom in on the source document in hopes that you'll be able to read along. And I'll make the print smaller here with control left bracket. And these are the different causes of death as determined by the medical examiner or the physician. Ischemia aguda al miocardio inmediato, choque séptico 10 horas, sepsis 48 horas, diabetes mellitus se ignora, hipotiroidismo se ignora. And so as I understand, um, we started with the most um, pertinent and immediate cause of death and then worked our way down to other factors that had an impact um, or may have had an impact. So for isthemia aguda, I looked this up because I don't know just at the drop of a hat how to say isthemia aguda al miocardio, but the consensus in English seems to be acute myocardial isthemia. I notice there's a few changes in the spelling, but otherwise it's pretty close to the Spanish because they're both from our shared Latin medical heritage. Um, immediate and immediate implying immediate cause of death. I put a comma there because grammatically immediate needs to be separated from the um, first few words. Septic shock for choque septico. I'm going to add a comma, 10 hours. Um, sepsis is the same in English and Spanish, 48 hours. And then these last two don't have a bullet um, with an alphabet letter in a parentheses. So we have diabetes, mellitus, comma, unknown, uh, se ignora, uh, is sometimes unknown in English, sometimes it means uh, ignored, but um, just given the context, I feel like unknown is a closer English cultural equivalent. Hypothyroidism, because this is all caps, the, um, the default in word is not to spell check things that are all caps, and so you have to be extra careful. Spell it right. Hypothyroidism unknown. And then we have another horizontal line. Control E for centered. Question in the chat. Can you use human remains for cadaver? Sure. Human remains is a synonym for cadaver. Um, I feel like uh, body. Uh, body is a, is a more common term in legal documents in um, death certificates. If you're talking about like a, a medical expert testifying at a murder trial, then a cadaver or a corpse might be used. Causas de la defunción. Um, take caps lock off. Say causes of death. Um, causes of decease would be another good choice. Uh, and those are actually, the formatting is kind of weird here. The these, this list of five things should be down under causes, causes de función, but it sort of crosses over. I'm just going to match it in the translation. Um, no, I changed my mind. 
because it crosses over and it's partially down here, I think I'll fix the formatting. I think I'll put these two down here. Ah, oh, then it starts getting confused over the horizontal line. The problem with these horizontal lines that Word creates automatically is you don't have much control over them. Uh, Word decides where it wants to put them. So I'm just going to leave it like that. Should be as clear in the translation. Then let's zoom back out here and see this box that's coming up. Looks like two columns and two rows. So that's easy enough to create. Go up to insert in your menu bar and choose a two column, two row drop down. Everything in here is left justified. So I'll select it all and hit control L for left justify. Anotaciones marginales are marginal notes or marginal annotations. Certificación, new certification, the obvious choice, the cognate. It's very small. And if you can't read it, it says sin anotaciones marginales. So I'm going to um, take my font down a little bit smaller with the control left bracket and put no marginal notes. You could also say without marginal notes. That'd be a more um, literal translation. And then we have a paragraph here that's just full of some really delicious legalese that takes some picking apart and <laughs> reassembling and workshopping to get it into comprehensible English legalese. So let me zoom in again, and I'll read it out loud in case it's not legible on your screens. It's 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 it's, uh, it's barely legible on mine because it's a, a JPEG that's taken from another document, and the resolution is poor. Se extiende la presente copia certificada con fundamento en los artículos 419, 23 y 28 del Código Familiar para el Estado de Morelos y artículos 2, fracciones 5, 9, 10 y 11 y 11, 11 del reglamento del registro civil del estado de Morelos. La firma electrónica con la que cuenta es vigente en la fecha de expedición, tiene validez jurídica y probatoria de acuerdo a las disposiciones legales en la materia. So, when I'm reading something like this, first I just try to make out the writing and then I think about what it means. And so the meaning that I take away is this copy is issued based on these laws and regulations that are in effect and the electronic signature is valid at the time of issue and this gives the document legal and uh, probatory or evidentiary validity. Uh, we can see it good. Um, so again, I'm going to make my font a little smaller so it mirrors the original. And it took me a while to come up with a translation I liked of this. I'm just going to copy it off of my, my cheat sheet here, my printout. This certified copy is issued. Let me make the English bigger, too. I don't know how big your monitors are or how good the resolution is in Zoom today. Depends on our respective bandwidths. This certified copy is issued based on articles. Um, articulos is not capitalized in Spanish. The standard in English is to capitalize the word article in section articles 419, comma, 423, comma, and 428. You can decide whether you want to use the Oxford comma or not of the state family code of Morelos, semicolon, um, 4, 7, um, and the 4 and the 7. And articles two sections for fracciones. I'm going to use sections and capitalize it, even though the F isn't in fracciones. I'll stick with the Roman numerals because that's common enough in English legalese. And 11, whoops, don't need capital letters here, and 11. And then in the Spanish it says, y once del reglamento. And we don't know, it's gone back to Arabic numerals instead of Roman numerals. And so I, in my reading that implies um, articulo once. And so I'm going to add the implied articulo and article 11. And I'm going to go back and take out the plural S in articles up here because I believe it's, I'm saying articulo dos y once. 
And in Spanish, you don't repeat articulos, and in English, you do put it before each Roman numeral, each, um, each number. And Article 11 of the Civil Registry Regulations, or the Vital Statistics Regulations, Civil Registry Regulations. Uh, use Vital Statistics. It's a little bit more familiar to the average U.S. English reader. Vital Statistics Regulations of the State of Morelos, period. The Electronic signature. This is capitalized in the Spanish. I don't see any reason to capitalize in the, in the English. The electronic signature that it bears is current at the date of issue. Semicolon. There's a comma in the Spanish, but this is a an independent clause. So I'm going to use a semicolon. It has legal and probatory or evidentiary validity in accordance with the legal provisions on the matter. Disposiciones legales en la materia. Um, in la materia could be on the subject, on the matter, in the matter. In the matter. We're talking about this field of the law. And I've got some chat questions. Fracciones, subsections, code for article. Um, I I wouldn't consider that wrong, either of those options. Um, missed the word for date. Uh, de acuerdo. Um, the electronic signature that it bears is current at the date. Thank you. Date of issue. Okay. Any other suggestions? Feel free to jump in. This is uh, this is um, uh, a group translation, translation by committee, and I welcome your opinions. Then down here we have a los 19 días del mes de septiembre, all caps, on the 19th of September, you can't say of the month of September, but that's awkward in English, uh, 2021, and they have some spaces, and doy fe, I attest, is the usual formula in English context for the same idea as doy fe. It's better it's not better to stick to section because it's more normalized. Okay, thank you. Let me zoom back out so we can see the whole width of the document. Scroll, 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 scroll. Okay, then this table closes. So I'll go back out to the main part of the file. And, oh, and I see that this is left justified, not justified. So control L to match that justification. Um, then we have uh, several sections going across and to keep everything straight, I'm going to insert a table again. Some people use text boxes. I found text boxes to be harder um, to manipulate if you're going to go back and reuse the same format. So I've just taken to using tables instead. One, two, three, four. I would say there's generally four columns going across here. First, we have a QR code. Those are the codes that you can read with your smartphone, the big squares. Um, then we have uh, sort of a coat of arms or a shield. You can decide what you want to call this. Um, but it's for the state of Morelos, and it has text inside that is legible and in Spanish. So I'm going to translate that. And it says, um, uh, la tierra vue, no, la tierra valera, a quienes la trabajan con sus manos. Is that vuelva, volviera, volviera? Help me out here. What's that? What's that word on the left? La tierra something, a quienes la trabajan con sus manos. In this case, I would probably go to Google and put in uh, Morelos and just get an image with the more legible copy of this, the Morelos Escudo. La tierra volverá. Okay, volverá in kind of a fancy old font. So let's say the land, or you could say the earth, the land shall return, volverá, to those who work it with their hands. And if you want, you can say in square brackets, um, slogan, motto, volverá, volverá. Okay, good. Thank you for your 
input everybody. And then there's an even smaller, um, little, uh, barely legible um, banner in the middle that says something y libertad. And to help me make it out, I'm going to go back to Google Image Search, Tierra y Libertad. So I'll hit enter, and then use a smaller font and say land and liberty or land and freedom. And then probably mention that there is an image here because there's an image of maybe a corn plant and a star and ground, but you don't have to go into great detail describing that. The recipient can just look back and see it. Uh, the coat of arms, what it stands for, you could say the coat of arms of the state of Morelos, but um, I don't feel it's the translator's responsibility to research every image on there and explain to the recipient uh, what it stands for. I feel like uh, it's doing enough to just uh, translate the text on there, and then if they are curious, they can do a little bit of research themselves. That's just a personal uh, style guide. Then very small, it says Código de Verificación, Verification Code. 312-316-843216561. And then there is a barcode under that. Then the next uh, vertical section here, let me drag this over so it's closer to the formatting in the original. Control E to, to center it. Electronic signature, colon. And then we have this huge long string, which they started putting recently on, on the official documents from Mexico and maybe some other countries. but at first, when these came out, I would painstakingly zoom in and retype all 150 characters or whatever, and finally decided um, that nobody needs that. That's not useful to the client or to the end user. Um, and I've started treating it just as I would a QR code or a barcode and describing it. And they want to go back. Does it say Valora or Volvera? I believe it says Volvera. OK. Um, so I've decided to just treat it as a barcode and then put in here something like a three line alphanumeric sequence. And so far, no end user has ever rejected this shorthand. So I recommend it to you to signature. You don't have to be able to read the signature, just mention that it's there. Then we have my good friend, Salma Hayek. So I'll type her name and for licenciado, since we don't have an exact equivalent in US, um, for licenciado or licenciada, I've taken to calling that a licensed professional because it implies somebody who is a professional who's graduated with roughly the equivalent of a bachelor's degree and then passed a government exam to receive a license to practice some profession and even number of professions might be a licenciado. So this is as close as I can get in concise English. Oficial del Registro Civil, you can say vital statistics officer, you could also say officer of the civil registry, that would be fine. Um, in the US, that, pro that position might be like a county clerk, but county clerk is so far removed. Um, it's such a loose translation that I shy away from that. And then here we have QR code again. And I'll mention that there is an actual QR code underneath the words that say QR code. You might feel that's redundant, and it is, but there you go. That's how, I, that's how I'm going to do it. Now we've come to the bottom of the page, but I do see there's some very fine print down here, which I'll read aloud in case it's not legible. El contenido del acta puede ser verificado en la siguiente liga. And it has a URL. Capturando el identificador electrónico que se encuentra en la parte superior derecha del acta para su consulta en, and then after that, it's not legible on this copy, I zoomed into the PDF um, so that I could read it better. If it's entirely illegible in all sources you have as a translator, then it's okay just to put illegible. Um, you don't have to try to recreate something. You don't have to call the client and say, hey, can you read it on the document? You can do that. But I'm certifying that I was able to read the text and translate it accurately. And so I don't want to trust somebody else's opinion of what it says if I can't confirm it independently. So control left bracket a couple times to get down to a 10 point font here. The contents of this certificate can be verified at the following link colon. 
and you type it just like it is. You don't translate anything in a URL. Registrocivil.gov.mx acta next consulta folio.gsp. And then once you hit space, Word is going to automatically change that into a hyperlink and underline it and turn it blue, but it's not underlined in blue in the source. So hit Control Z to back up out of that little convenience and then go on with the translation. Using the electronic identifier, no reason to capitalize that in English, identifier, and I'll zoom in to make sure the target here is visible to you. That is found in, on the upper right-hand side of the certificate or on mobile devices. And this is the part that's illegible right now on the screen. Download an app to read the QR code, period. OK. Um, this is uh, all of the front side of the document. I'm going to pause here before I do the back side. The back side is a lot shorter. But are there any questions so far? Para Oficina de Registro Civil, can we also use Civil Records Office and Population Registry Office? Sure. I like Civil Re Records Office better than Population Registry Office, but I don't think either of those are wrong. Kind of depends on what it's normally called in the company that, in the country that's receiving it. If you're not familiar, like let's say you live in Latin America never lived in the US, you're not sure what this is normally called in Maryland or wherever your client is going to, get onto the website for the government of Maryland and look up their page of birth certificates and see what kind of terminology is used in that context. Uh, devices, oh uh, yep, I think that's the British spelling of devices with an S. You're right, it should be a C. Thank you. Okay, I'll scroll down now. Um, at the end of this page, I'm going to insert my traditional line of hyphens and left blank intentionally, just to show that this big blank space here isn't a mistake. There's nothing missing. Um, that's sort of a tradition on a lot of US legal documents that I've found helpful um, for here text and translation. So the back just has some stamps and seals and watermarks. And probably no end user cares about what's on the back, but sometimes the client will. They're like, oh, no, you have to do both sides. And so if they tell you that and they pay you to translate both sides, then, of course, why not? So here is where we can start inserting this. I see one, two, three, four, five uh, sections going across. So I'll put in a five, a six, uh, five by one table. And first, there's something sort of shiny here that might be like a QR code decal, um, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to call it um, a decal. Uh, if on the original I can see it's a QR code, I might describe it that way. Then here we have circular seal of Mexico, and you can just cut and paste this from above if you want to save time. United. Mexican states, and then we have Segob in really big font, so I'll hit control right bracket several times, then type Segob, control L to left justify that, and then control left bracket to make the font small again. And Segob stands for Secretari Secretaria de Gobernación, and so normally I would explain what this acronym stands for, but since they explain right underneath, I'll just translate it. For Secretaria de Gobernación, you could say uh, Ministry, Department of State, Ministry of State, a Ministry of the Interior, Secretariat of the Interior. We don't have an exact equivalent in the U.S., so you have to come up with something that sounds right to you. Department of State. The problem with using, if you look this up, some sources will say use the Department of the Interior, but in the U.S., the Department of the Interior does something else. They handle, like... Um, national parks and land, and the, the Secretaria de Gobernación has more to do with the international relations. And so I think Department of State is a pretty good, concise, not equivalent, but uh, close enough. Okay. 10-point font, your Dirección General del Registro Nacional de Población e Identidad. Let's call the, that the National 
population and personal identity registry office. Let's drag this over so everything fits. Let me drag this over. We don't need this much space here. You just grab onto the horizontal, the vertical line and drag it to adjust the formatting. This should probably be smaller, so I'll select that, control F bracket to make it smaller. And then at the end here, we have this, what is that, a, a decal, a seal, a crest, um, a logo. I don't usually use logo for a government entity. I'm going to call it an emblem. There's different words that would work here. And then caps lock, kind of frick, which stands for underneath it, it gives you the translation or the, the meaning of the acronym. So I'll just translate that. Consejo Nacional de Funcionarios del Registro Civil. National Council. Make sure you get council and council correct. Council with an SEL is like um, an attorney. That would be the legal counsel or advice. I'm from a counselor is counsel. If it's a CIL, then that's a council like a junta directiva an organization of leaders of uh, vital statistics officers, or you could say um, vital records officials, um, funcionarios, official or officer or bureaucrat or civil servant is a funcionario in English. And then down here we have the same um, seal as before, and that was kind of, it took me a while to type that, so I'm just going to scroll up and select it here with my mouse. Control C to copy it and scroll back down and paste it down here in the middle and maybe break it up a little bit so it looks so it's formatted more like that center. And then we have some spaces and Morelos, first letter capitalized, large font, and nothing else after that. Now, I do see there's all these little lines in the background, and that's a security feature like you have in currency um, to uh, minimize uh, counterfeiting. So if you want, you can describe that. Um, you could say uh, security paper features fine filaments woven into it or something uh, if you want to. So view, remove split. The next step is to zoom out and look at the whole translation as a whole. Make sure you're happy with the spacing, the um, font sizes. The originals single page may go on to two pages, sometimes even three pages. If there's a lot of fine print on there. That's fine. I see that I still have the tables turned on here, so I'm going to select that and turn off the borders. So it looks more like the original. Um, I'll leave these borders on. Yeah, it looks about right. And then the second one looks about right. And so for me, um, I put a left blank intentionally and end of translation at the very end. And this is to reduce the chance that somebody else might add more to your translation, um, like hire you to translate one page and then translate a bunch of pages themselves and staple them on the back. Um, so I've been end of translation when my translation ends. And then since it's a six page document with the page number down there in the certification statement, you can say this is a six page translation to again, sort of lock the pieces together and indicate what you actually provided and where your contribution ended. So that concludes the translation. And now I'd like to invite any questions or comments from the group. I hope that you will, uh, the biggest takeaway is that you can do these certified translations for legal use in the US, no matter where you are and what your credentials are. Just um, be careful, uh, do the appropriate research, give your best effort, proofread it yourself when you're done, and then get a colleague or a coworker or somebody else to also proofread it because you wanna catch mistakes before it goes back to your client and definitely before the client submits it to the end user. Manuela asks if we would be doing a site translation and there it says lease for licenciado. Should we also say licensed professional? You can. Um, you could say um, licensee, license holder, 
you could even say licenciado um, and then explain what licenciado is. Can we get a copy of the Word doc you just did? Yes. If you weren't here when I posted these links, let me put them in the chat again. And this tells you where to find all the things afterwards. Um, there's the fundraiser for AFSSA. Um, there's the blog where I'm going to post this Word file that you can download um, once I get it all done next week. Um, there's the YouTube channel where you can go back and watch the video if you missed part of it or if you'd like to share it with somebody. And there's the link for reviews for my little family business here, Text and Translation. That's if you if you want to help us out and leave a link, leave a review, that'd be cool.